Okay, folks, it is high noon on the 21st day of the 21st week of the 21st year of the 21st century. How cool is that? Um, I am wondering, am I showing on the screen? Okay, great. I'm gonna open us up in just a second. Um, folks, I wanna welcome you all. We are here today, which is a great um, spring day in Denver, Colorado. And we are welcoming um, a lecture as part of our Enhancing Wellness for Healthcare Professionals Through the Engagement with the Arts series. So my name is Catherine Reed. I'm an art therapist. I am also the manager of the Ponzio Creative Arts Therapy Program at Children's Hospital Colorado. So I am part of a large um, research team. Actually, it's a small research team, but it's a very exciting research team called CORAL, which stands for the Colorado Resilience and Arts Lab. And we are the first research team funded by the National Endowment of the Arts, the NEA, here on the Anschutz campus in Denver or Aurora, Colorado. So we're super excited to be hosting this lecture series, which we began in January. And what we're able to do through this series is really meet some of the most fascinating and brilliant um, characters in the, in the work to coalesce a vision between our healthcare professionals throughout the country and our arts world. Um, those are really two different communities that don't always speak the same language. So one of our goals in CORAL is to bring together um, some of the experts in both fields to start to really build that bridge between them so that we can use the arts so we can recognize how important the arts are in our healthcare settings. Um, so our research is exciting, but today even more exciting is the speaker I'm about to introduce you to. Her name is Susan Mag Salmon. She is the executive director of the International Arts and Mind Lab at John Hopkins University. Susan is going to present to us her work and we will be watching on the Zoom call um, for about the first 35 minutes of this hour. As she is speaking, please consider your questions that you'd like to ask her directly because when she is completed with her presentation, we're going to have a question and answer session. And um, it'll be a really nice casual discussion with Susan. So you can actually ask her direct questions through the question and answer um, tabs below your screen. So versus using the chat, we prefer to use the question and answers. And then I will play moderator and I will read your questions to Susan so that the two of us will be having that conversation at the end. And so that is the most important thing to know as you're listening to Susan is that you can engage with her directly, just not on video. So we found that this is the best way to really get the most out of these hours. Um, so thank you for joining us today. We're really thrilled to introduce Susan and to learn about her work. So at that, I will hand it over to Susan. Welcome, Susan. Susan, I think you're still Susan, on mute. You're muted. Thank you, thank you. Um, this is what I do. I leave myself on mute and I leave my lights on in my car. <laughs> all the time. Um, so what I was saying is thank you, Catherine, for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, it's also a beautiful spring day here in Baltimore. And so um, just glorious. It's wonderful to have have this kind of kind of weather. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, pull my slides up. Let's see if I can get us started. Okay, I'm assuming everybody can see that David good. Looks great. Great, great. So today um, I'm gonna to talk about um, healing our healers, restorative spaces for our frontline workers. And um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, 
um, you know, over the last year um, plus, um, our team has had a front line to the healthcare workers um, at Hopkins um, and many of the other frontline workers that have been doing such incredible work. And um, I don't know how many folks um, on the call are serving in those roles, but I just want to say thank you uh, from myself, but also from our team. Um, we're really grateful for everything that you have done and are, are doing for us. Um, and I'm really excited to share some of the work that um, our lab um, and others have been doing to try to provide a little bit of comfort and support over the last year, and hopefully um, as we move out of the most urgent time um, and into um, some new semblance of, of um, new normal, that we can also be there for you in ways that um, help to restore um, uh, and, and provide resiliency and bring back you know, the joy that we have all um, felt uh, missing in some ways. So just to tell you a little bit about our lab, um, we are um, the International Arts and Mind Lab um, at Johns Hopkins University in the Peterson Brain Science Institute. And our, our goal is really to amplify and accelerate this field of neuroaesthetics. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a moment. Um, but we are really in interested at a very um, profound level in amplifying human potential through the lens of arts and aesthetic experiences. Um, multidisciplinary is hugely important for us, as is this notion around translational science and how you can translate this research into practice and how practice can also inform research. So um, we've really been spending, I guess, really now the last 10 years thinking deeply about um, what is art, how does art and aesthetic experience really serve um, for, to support health, well-being, and learning? So just a little bit about what we do. Excuse me, Susan, could you put your slides into slideshow mode? Sure. I, yep, there we go. There, yeah, perfect. Good? Thank okay, you. Okay, great. So just a little bit about what we do. Um, we work in three main areas. The first is research, and that's really the core of our lab. Um, we, we work interdisciplinarily, as I mentioned, and um, at a, in a translational mode, primarily. Um, we developed a model several, several years ago called impact thinking that is a, a, a consensus framework that really looks to provide some guideposts on how to think about how to study um, different arts and aesthetic experiences and interventions from a problem-based frame. So we're very agnostic to the art form, but we're very interested in how these different types of sensory modalities can um, really help um, in a variety of things, whether that's in the clinic, in the, in the community, at home, um, on an individual level, and also on a community level. We also um, provide um, outreach and education um, through classes and webinars, number of publications. We both attend conferences and we also host conferences. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, and we're also um, working to build this community. Uh, when our lab launched, uh, we had a mandate from the president of Hopkins and the dean of the School of Medicine to understand sort of what the there there was for this work around neuroaesthetics and arts, health, and well being. And what we saw was that it was everywhere, literally everywhere in every country. But there was not um, a real ecosystem and sort of a consensus or, or a connective tissue, whether you were talking with um, artists or cl clinicians or even designers and architects, that everyone was sort of doing something, but research was not being woven through consistently. Um, and, and different types of research really weren't being shared with other communities where it would really have been helpful. So over the last um, two years, we have been working with the Aspen Institute to develop something called the Neuro Arts Blueprint, which is a global initiative to look at strengthening um, and standardizing and beginning to really propel this field of neuroaesthetics by coalescing all of these diverse constituencies. And that includes a whole mix of folks that are researchers in public health, in cognitive neuroscience, in neurology, in medicine, um, and thinking about clinical research, but also artists and philosophers, designers, um, uh, philanthropy education, and then looking at leadership, 
policy making and funding. And wrapping into that is this idea of how do you create um, create this connective tissue in an ecosystem, but how do you also communicate this in ways that um, bring this idea of arts, health, and well being to the general public? to different constituencies and communities that can use this work, whether it's in schools or at home or in healthcare um, and community development. Um, so this blueprint um, has been in development for the last year and a half, two years. Um, it will be released in the fall. And, and the blueprint is really the beginning of a, of a of three to five year implementation plan to really bring this field forward, to really begin to move it into the mainstream. So I'm looking forward to sharing more of that with you as we, as we bring the report forward. So I've talked a little bit about this, but just to sort of underscore what we're about, um, our work is really looking at the arts and aesthetic experiences in a way that change our brains, body, and behavior. And we believe that by doing this, um, this work, this sort of profound superpower that humans have makes us happier, healthier, and smarter. So everything that we do kind of comes back to this basic hypothesis and belief system. If you sort of boil all this down um, at the heart of what we think neuro arts or neuro aesthetics is, is a convergence of the arts, health and science and technology. And it's really been over the last 20 years that there has been the um, computing and imaging and biometric power to really understand in non-invasive ways what's happening inside the body and the brain when we are engaged in highly sensory experiences um, and highly representational experiences, um, which we often call the arts. And I think, um, you know, as arts get further away from human expression um, as a commodity, we forget that this is really how we communicate this, this idea of human expression, human reflection, symbols, metaphor, movement, um, all of these ways that what we call art really have, um, have been um, intuitively known, um, the power of them by artists, but now through lots of different types of technology, we're really starting to be able to understand what is happening physiologically. And that's important because it allows us to be able to think more deeply about how we can use the, this power in healing both disease, physical disease, chronic disease, mental health, and well being. So when we think about art modalities, um, our, our, our lab, and I think many others, really organize them in 10 categories. Um, you're looking at nine. The 10th is culinary arts. And um, but you can see that there is a wide variety of experiences that we use to talk to the world and to understand the world. Um, and I'm gonna be talking mostly today about architecture, design and human built environment, this idea of intentional spaces um, as a way to talk about um, frontline workers and healthcare. But if you look at this um, sort of art modalities, blow it out, I think of this as the art modality periodic table. And this is just a one level cut. You can see that within visual arts, there are many kinds of ways to express individual um, preferences to uh, to, to, to share your world, but also as groups, and also to use these for health well and well-being for prevention and intervention. Um, we started to look more deeply over the last 10 years at the scientific evidence of the arts. And just a caveat um, footnote is, by and large, the arts have been incredibly underfunded from a scientific point of view. Um, I always think of it as kind of a gig economy where researchers will do some kind of side project along with their sort of day job in order to, to really move this forward. Um, however, over the last several years, NIH has started to fund um, work in the arts specifically around um, sound and music. And of course, um, NEA is an amazing supporter of the arts and has also been funding work around this marriage of the science um, science and art, um, notably in a project that they've been funding um, called Creative Forces along with um, the Veterans Administration and, and NIH. So um, this, the funding is coming in the United States. In other countries, um, there is funding um, that tends to be um, often focused on practice, um, 
but is underwritten by um, federal funding. And there is um, increasingly more funding to support this. And that's important because the more we understand about the mechanisms of this work, um, the more we can start to think about the um, prescription of this work. Um, but one of the things we do know is that the arts alter uh, a complex physiological network of interconnected systems. And I wanna underscore this idea of interconnected systems. You know, the brain is incredibly complex and there are many systems at play. And what is unique about the arts is that oftentimes the arts will engage multiple systems simultaneously. We also know that the arts are um, in different types of art forms for different purposes can have a very targeted effect. Um, and that can be neuronal, it can be psychological. Um, we know more and more about the endocrine system and the immune system and the idea around how you manage inflammation um, using different art forms and, and thinking about cortisol and dopamine. Um, we've seen some really interesting studies in the last several years around the circulatory system and also respiratory system. Um, right now, um, there is work happening with singing and lung capacity because of some of the um, results of COVID and, and long haulers. So we're, we're seeing this work being used in very interesting ways. And then at a higher order brain level, systems level, um, we know that the arts can influence cognition, um, affect reward and motor systems. And so think about things like memory or attention um, or the ability to really learn and retain information. Um, so for different purposes, using different art forms um, with different constituencies, there is um, an uh, unending infinite pot number of possibilities and how to think about how we use the arts. And the more we know about them, from a neurobiological point of view and a physiological point of view, the more we can target those kinds of interventions. Um, so just a couple of findings of things that we do know, um, and these are sort of at a sort of a hot air balloon level, um, but just to make the point, um, and this is in some, these are some of these are generalized um, and some of these are for specific populations. But with visual arts, we know that um, arts help people recover from um, mental health issues, including depression, stress, and anxiety. And they're also able to help um, open up speech and language pathways when they've been disrupted by trauma. Uh, Creative Forces, which I mentioned, has done this very effectively in working with veterans and active military who use mask making and visual arts to create visual symbols of some of their experiences. And by creating those symbols, they're able to, to come and find narratives and put language to um, emotions and experiences that begin to help them heal. Um, and there are many examples of that. Um, we know that preferential music lowers blood pressure, um, can address chronic pain, also address mood and memory, and this is across the ages. Um, there's a lot of work being done right now looking at the use of music for dementia and trying to stay off symptoms of dementia or reduce symptoms of dementia. Um, and in early childhood, we know that music plays a preventative role in helping to build resilience and, um, and, and, and enhance neuroplasticity, just, just to name a few. Um, Performing arts is a very broad category. It can mean theater, it can mean spoken word, um, it can mean mime, um, it's a very broad category. Um, but two things that we know about performing arts are this ability to perspective take, so to understand someone else's point of view. Um, and that's really important in community. It's really important as we um, begin to navigate complexities around, um, around culture and, um, and equity. Um, it's also really um, incredibly value, valuable in increasing empathy and, and really being able to understand and have um, sympathy and empathy for the other. Um, and these are extremely complex emotions. Um, dance and Parkinson's we know a lot about as well as looking at things like um, other neurodegenerative illnesses and also things like stroke where the, the movement and dance becomes um, catalysts for um, being able to um, have broader range of motion, being able to do dance and um, movement for longer periods of time so there are greater benefits. And this work is starting to be looked at more deeply in clinic 
clinics to see if there is um, greater gains for um, neurodegeneration when you're using movement and dance. And I'll say an added benefit to dance is the release of oxytocin so that um, there is a sense of connection and, and belonging. Um, and, and many times people that are experiencing um, chronic disease or mental health issues feel very isolated. And so um, again, this goes back to this idea of complex systems and multiple re rewards. Expressive writing is being used um, extensively for depression and mental health, and also looking at um, um, general um, uh, well-being and um, with, with uh, great, great advantage. And then finally, in architecture, um, you know, it's interesting that we are working so hard to bring the outdoors in and biophilic elements um, are being used very successfully in understanding light spectrum, thinking about greenery and, um, and bringing nature, physical, live nature in and seeing how that reduces stress and improves mood and also can increase cognition and attention and performance. And I'll talk a little bit of that, about that specifically in a project that we've been working on. So I'm gonna transition to talk a bit about art-based interventions for healthcare workers. And in our lab and others, I think we've been thinking about this in two ways. Um, prior to um, COVID, there was a quite a bit of work in looking at helping healthcare workers develop um, empathy and perspective taking in working with patients. So um, looking beyond the disease, looking at the whole person. Um, there's been a lot of work in medical schools um, where using art as a way to develop greater clinical observational skills to also cultivate the sense of empathy through looking at poetry or um, other visual arts that might in fact um, help to identify themes or, or, um, or, or metaphor that would relate to a patient. Um, and also with the goal of del delivering um, higher quality healthcare that is more humanistic. Um, and I think a residual of that was this idea of reducing burnout on the job. Even before the pandemic, burnout, stress, anxiety for healthcare workers was already quite high. Um, but this work in sort of thinking about this empathy um, within healthcare, I think had already been happening. So marry that to um, the enormous stress that's happened um, through COVID, uh, you start to see some other art forms being introduced. So um, I mentioned architecture and human built design, also sound and music, and then this idea of nature, both nature um, in its tr truest, purest form, but also bringing nature inside. And we know that these elements in combination and separately uh, reduce stress and anxiety. They, they boost mood, um, they improve cognitive performance, and they also reduce burnout. And, um, and from a HR perspective, um, really try to help address things like retention and morale. So in our lab, we look at um, intentional spaces, designing better spaces for, for health and well-being. And we do it in a number of different environments. Um, I'll show, I'm going to talk briefly about some work we've done in clinics, but also in the workplace, home, and community. And then also we think very deeply about this idea of virtual spaces. Um, they, they are um, as real as um, physical spaces in many ways, and they can be used when folks can't get to a physical space, even can't move into a, an environment within a workplace or a clinic. So um, we've done a little bit of work there as well. Uh, the first project I want to mention is a project called uh, A Space for Being. Uh, several years ago with uh, Google and um, Suchi Reddy, who is an architect, and Mudo, we developed a neuroaesthetics exhibition that was really trying to show the impact of design on our biology and well-being. And we were very interested in um, uh, trying to see if we could use biometrics to um, show participants what was happening in their body when they were moving through spaces. So we designed a 6,000 square foot um, uh, exhibition in Milan at the Milan Design Fair, where uh, we outfitted our participants with a wristband that uh, captured several biological measures, including variable heart rate, respiration, and body temperature. 
and they move through one of three, they move through three rooms um, for five minutes in each room with sort of a palate cleanser in between. And what we were able to show through really spectacular um, uh, data visualization was what was happening physiologically in their bodies as they moved through each space. And then we presented the participants with uh, a, a kind of a watercolor burst that showed them where they were most at ease, which of the three rooms they were most at ease with. And the key takeaway was that um, we often aren't always in tune with what our body is telling us. One third of the people that came through the exhibition um, were not able to choose the room that they felt most at ease in. And, so, and many were very surprised that um, the room that they did feel most at ease in um, was uh, the one that they actually were sort of guessing. Um, so it's super, it's interesting that um, when we're connecting mind and body, um, we're really able to begin to um, understand what we need. And I think one of the big takeaways for us in this exhibition was that because we're so transactional, because we're so stressed, because we're in such a state of movement, we don't always know how our bodies are feeling and what they're telling us. And when we do, we can make better and different decisions. And um, we have a video that um, we'll share in the chat that um, gives you sort of a, a little bit more um, experiential um, um, knowledge about that, that, uh, that work. The next room I wanted to share is something that we've been working on for several years with Kennedy Krieger. Um, Kennedy Krieger is a hospital for children with neurological disorders um, and both acquired um, and developmental. And several years ago, we started working on the design of a multi-sensory room that used um, different sensory inputs that were personalized for children who are waking up from um, disorders of consciousness um, at some level. And what we were able to do um, um, was design a study where we could put scent, light, sound, texture into a space that um, was shared with to us um, by a parent. And the, the idea of this, this room is that we believe that we can help children wake up faster and better. Um, and so we've been, we've been working on this as a prototype and, are, and we have not launched this yet, but we're really excited to, to think about how this might work with or disorders of consciousness, but also with things like chronic pain or even waking up from um, surgery. Um, can you create unique environments, personalized environments that allow you to heal better and faster? Um, and, and how can you do that in a very um, um, disseminated and um, democratized way where it's a very um, easy thing to do? So we literally can outfit rooms with these types of projections. So I'm gonna talk now about healthcare workers and, um, and some of the things that um, we have seen over the last year plus with COVID-19. And much of what I'm gonna share um, are things that you already know, but just to level set um, uh, sort of what has been happening. And then I'll share some of the interventions and projects that we've been working on that have been um, geared to trying to provide some um, immediate support. Um, most recently, there was a study done uh, of 97,000 healthcare workers. And the authors of that report wrote um, a really beautiful um, sentence that I wanna share. Um, the current need for brief, feasible and scalable interventions to promote healthcare workers' wellness and resilience is unparalleled. And I think that's the, the, the spirit of the work that has been happening um, for many um, healthcare workers over the last year is to try to provide immediate accessible care. Um, we know that one in five healthcare workers experience anxiety and depression and PTSD. Um, we also know that this is um, significantly higher when it's general, when you look at a generalized population. Um, the World Health Organization has been um, tracking some of this work and has seen that um, depression and anxiety for the generalized population is really around 5%. So you look at the enormous um, difference in what frontline workers, healthcare workers are experiencing. We also know that half US doc of the US doctors are reporting, um, um, reporting burnout and a third of nurses 
are uh, remarking um, uh, that they're exhausted, that there's a sense of cynicism and feelings of ineffectiveness in, in their work. Um, certainly the pandemic has exacerbated burnout, but it has been there and it was there um, prior to the pandemic, but it really has, has escalated. Um, I think uh, experts think that this work, um, that these feelings of burnout and PTSD and trauma um, um, are really the tip of the iceberg. And so I think as practitioners and um, artists and clinicians who are really working to develop arts and aesthetic experiences, um, I think there is a sense of commitment for the long run and to make sure that um, we don't see this as something that's over, but rather something that we need to tend and care for um, over the coming years. So I'm gonna talk about Recharge and Resilience Center at Hopkins. Um, last year, working with the Center for um, Wellbeing at Hopkins and the RISE program, which is an employee-based program um, that really looks at how to support healthcare workers, um, we developed um, um, a model for developing immersive biophilic spaces that support our workers. Um, and we've been working with um, Mount Sinai Hospital and also um, Studio Elsewhere, who have done phenomenal work in lifting these up and putting them now in eight, um, eight centers in New York, but also putting them in, in um, institutions all over the country. Um, and what we're working on now is being able to um, um, lift these rooms up and, and we're, we're using a consistent survey where we can look at pre and post responses across a number of institutions to start to see what's, what, what are some of the generalizable learnings, but what can we learn about these kinds of spaces? So to tell you a little bit more about what I mean by biophilic design, um, we literally are looking at bringing the outdoors in. And the research in, in biophilic design um, is quite definitive. We know that um, nature um, um, and these kinds of design elements um, absolutely amplify the immune system. So looking at inflammation, um, we know that there are healthier microbiomes um, by, by, by long-term use of biophilic design. Um, there's better mental health outcomes, uh, favorable heart rate, lower blood pressure, reducing stress and anxiety. Also looking at respiratory issues and it's specifically around asthma and over time looking at lower uh, mortality. Um, biophilic space um, for um, Mount Sinai was um, designed based on the need of um, sports teams to be able to lower their physiology faster after these high endurance sports. And so um, they didn't want to meditate. They didn't want to do something. They wanted a passive experience where by moving into that space for a short period of time, they could lower their physiology and really come back to a homeostasis to a set point. And so these rooms were initially designed for um, athletes, high performing athletes, which I think is a really great um, analogy and metaphor for what happens for a frontline worker. So a recharge room is, um, is a space, in our case, eight by 10 feet, not very large necessarily, but it's an evidence-based space that um, addresses burnout, anxiety, um, stress, and also can look at enhanced cognition. So thinking about learning and memory and attention. It's a highly immersive space that's multi-sensory. And for us, that means sound or music. Um, it, can use sense, it can use olfactory or scent. Um, also thinking deeply about light and light spectrum um, and, and bringing in um, these projections of, um, of physical spaces. Um, there's also a high degree of personalization and it can be a private experience or it can be a, or it can actually be a group experience. So um, these rooms in New York um, have shown some really remarkable um, results in a very short period of time. Um, after only 15 minutes of uh, exposure in these biophilic rooms, um, we've seen a 60% reduction in stress. Um, we've also um, had staff report, excuse me, that these types of experiences um, are the most meaningful and highest impact intervention that they are having. I think in part that's because we're seeing that they are passive and people are coming in and really just 
um, allowing the space to um, impact them in these dense, different sensory um, systems, as opposed to having to actually do something. Um, in, in New York, we, we learned that the number one um, um, reflection uh, that over 4,000 people using this, these spaces had was a sense of gratitude um, and a sense of really just feeling that they were connect, that connect gratitude for connecting back to their physiology and to their sort of sense of sense of being. So it's been really it's been really uh, amazing to see how this work is un unfolding. Um, so a couple of other things I wanted to share with you and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, Megan is gonna share a recharge rooms tip sheet. This is a document that um, people that go through recharge rooms can take home with them so they can continue this work at home or in other environments and also share it with um, colleagues and friends and family. And so um, we hope that um, this will be a tool that you might be interested in, in using and sharing. Um, also over the period of uh, intense COVID period, our lab through Megan Howard's efforts, um, who's on the call today, who's our director of communications, developed something called the COVID-19 NeuroArts Field Guide. And it's an amazing collection of uh, arts-based and aesthetic-based responses to different aspects of COVID. So we looked at things like grief, we've looked at stigma, um, we've looked at um, how people feel isolated and what are some of these um, ways that we can um, use arts and aesthetic experience to move through those very difficult emotions. So let me stop there and um, open this up for questions. And um, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to, to talk with you today. All right, Susan, that was um, probably very brief considering the, the vast scope of your work, but really fascinating. I just wanna say thank you, first of all, for, I've, I've got all kinds of notes and, and the energy around your presentation and it's <laughs> connection and relationship to what we're doing with Coral. Um, and, and before I go into that though, I wanna read some of the questions that have popped in, okay? So the first one that I am seeing is from a person named Shale Wong, who sounds like um, she is in Denver. And she says, fascinating and exciting work. Thank you. We've recently established an arts alliance for health equity in Colorado. It's a partnership between the Farley Health Policy Center and Cleo Parker Robinson Dance. Our goal is to tri triangulate arts, health, and policy sectors and partners to achieve more equitable community health. So Susan, can you share more about how the Arts and Minds Lab is doing community outreach with messaging that connects your research to engage varied stakeholders? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so we are doing quite a bit of work um, in Baltimore um, and looking at how we can scale some of that, that work. Um, we have a very strong arts community that's connected to community health and well-being. We actually have something called Healing Cities in Baltimore that has been um, being stood up by um, several of our congressmen, and, and it really invites community organizations, um, churches, cultural arts organizations, um, libraries uh, to come together um, with this purpose of health and well-being and through the lens of arts and aesthetic experience. So one project that we, well, I'll give you two examples. Um, a small one, um, last summer, when children were not able to go to school, um, 30 arts organizations um, and education, and, and, our, and, our, and, our, and I should have mentioned schools, both public and private schools, um, came together to put together an, uh, an arts passport for children to learn um, in the summer. So we actually kitted, we made a playbook and kitted art materials so that children would continue to be able to learn over the summer. And as you know, summer slide is a really big thing for under-resourced communities. And not only um, do they not learn what they were learning in that academic year, it's cumulative. So it adds up and adds up and adds up. So we um, were really excited to be able to put that together. 
Another project, which is a bigger project, is a project that was funded by the T. Rowe Price Foundation, and that includes an intersection with our Baltimore City schools and libraries and many other cultural arts partners across the city. The project is called, is called One Book, and it's, it's actually an extraordinary project where each year one book is chosen, literally one book for seventh to ninth graders. Um, and the idea is to be able to um, read this book, not for credit, not for grade, but for community building and for conversation. And so um, we've now read um, um, uh, three books. The first two were um, books about gun violence and street violence. Um, one's called Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds. Um, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the second, Megan will post it, um, uh, which really allowed kids to perspective take and to put themselves using fiction, bio, um, uh, uh, bio feel, thinking about this idea of bibliotherapy, to be able to really understand um, what what choices you can make risk-free in reading fiction. And then they were able to talk with each other um, and, and create um, expressions of how they felt about these books. Um, what was remarkable was to see the ways that they chose to express themselves. Our lab was responsible for developing the survey instrument that um, measured what kids were thinking. So these kids all have experienced some kind of violence, um, gun violence, street violence, physical violence in some way. Um, they felt that they didn't have anybody to talk to, that they weren't, couldn't talk to their parents, couldn't talk to teachers, and felt uncomfortable because of stigma talking to peers. So expressing themselves through art, um, through these um, very natural spoken word pieces or dance pieces um, or, or written word um, gave them vehicles. Some kids actually have made films and then we culminate in a showcase where kids get to share their work. Um, each year, this has grown and grown and grown. Last year, we did um, we speak for ourselves by Dee Watkins, and it's really about it was so perfect. Um, um, we, it was about how other people speak for us, especially in under resourced communities and Black and Brown communities, and how we need to be able to um, have our own voice. And what does it take to build your voice? Um, there's a woman, fantastic researcher named Maria Rosario Jackson, who talks about cultural competency and this idea of cultural kitchen. How do our communities have, have that time and space to create their culture and their recipes and put them together in ways that are really unique when they've, in some cases, been diminished and, um, and, and, and not fostered and not nourished? So um, one book is now moving into our fourth year. I think two things that I want to say that are really interesting and important. Um, one is that um, the kids are part of choosing the books. The community is part of choosing the book. There is not an expert that says, I think you need to read this. And, and one of the lessons that we're learning is personalization is really important. Making sure that the community, whatever community you're working with, is telling you what they need, not what you think they need, and providing enough, um, uh, enough runway to be able to have programs develop over time and build this connective tissue between all of these institutions. Um, we distribute 12,000 books a year. And the first year, the biggest problem we had was distributing 12,000 books a year. Um, and so now that's a given. And, and now we're you know, into thinking this year, we're gonna be looking more deeply at what are people saying? What are these kids saying in there? Um, art, you know, the, the, what are they, what are they expressing? How are they coming at it? What are these, you know, how can they bring that forward and, and, and how can we showcase it in bigger ways? So it's a really exciting program. Um, and in our impact thinking model, which I mentioned, um, one of our, two of our, our steps, one is dissemination and one is scaling. So as everyone knows, art if, if you have an art, an evidence-based art experience that's really working, whether it's prevention or intervention, the hardest thing to do is to scale it. And often it's because there's not enough funding or there isn't an understanding of the value of the intervention. And so our lab is working to think deeply about the complexities of dissemination and the complexities of scaling and how do you do that? So this one book project is moving into that phase. That is such an intriguing program. I'm curious about the funding for it. Is that a, a, a nationally funded program or? So T. Rowe Price is a, is a 
I guess, a global uh, corporation, and it's their foundation that has funded it. Um, but what we're seeing is that other organizations are, are getting behind it. And so it's a, it's a scalable model. To be, at publishers have also um, been very generous in discounting books. Um, but these systems exist, right? The public library exists, the school system exists. So what we're doing is creating these relationships and, and, and building trust with groups that have always worked together, but, but are trying to optimize what the impact is of those right. relationships. And I think one of the most important things in this is that um, kids, even if they don't read the book, other kids are talking about it and they're just by hearing about it, they're gaining insight. So, I mean, the power of, of narrative is just extraordinary here. And it's, I love that it's as simple as one book. We're now starting to get parents to read the books and I'm thinking about, you know, a broader community book club, if you will, um, and, and broadening the, the, the reach of this project in Baltimore. But we also think it has potential to grow outside of the community. It sounds like it. I mean, it's, it provides such an inherent sense of belonging through the art form of writing, right? And then consuming writing, which not everyone does. And so- you No, and I'll add, I'll add one other piece to that. All of our authors have been African-American to date. Um, uh, we've had um, uh, uh, Nick Stone, who is an extraordinary um, African-American woman author who come, had came to Baltimore. Jason Reynolds came to Baltimore. Dee Watkins lives in Baltimore. And right. so the other thing is kids meeting authors that look like them yep. that and have a very similar life experience. These kids are like, I know what's possible. Mm -hmm. And their frames of references have not necessarily been that, right? And so I think there's also something really powerful about the accessibility of the artist. And even with COVID, we were able to do Zoom um, gatherings, um, but the in-person, connections have been really important. Wow. Oh, it's exciting. Like it gives me goosebumps, Susan, honestly. And I realized that I could just talk to you for the whole time, but I realized there's questions here. So I'm going to read you a couple more questions. The next one comes from Hillary Sin. She happens to be the dance movement therapist of our choral group who is um, facilitating clinical trials with our group um, as we are all doing their 12 week workshops for healthcare volunteers. Um, but in her day job, she's also doing um, daily dance movement therapy clinical groups for psychiatric patients primarily. So she says she is excited and grateful for your work. What have you learned, Susan, in the way of resilience advocacy and working with hospital administrations to sustain these types of, of spaces and experiences? So um, it's interesting, you know, at Hopkins, um, I would say when we first started this work, um, people knew more about what we were doing outside of Hopkins than inside Hopkins. <laughs> and, um, you know, we were doing a lot of interesting research and, uh, and we have a donor um, in, our, in our program who has always believed that the arts and aesthetic experiences change, your, change you and that they are, they are the closest thing to magic that there is. And so because of her, we were really allowed to kind of um, play and mess around and figure out what was going to work. And as that work started to grow and we shared that externally, it was mirrored back to the administration. So that was that's one piece that I think is really important. Initially, um, leadership was like, well, you know, we don't this is a nice to have, not a have to have. Um, but. Um, as we continue to build alliances across all of the schools at Hopkins, so public health, education, arts and sciences, nursing, bioethics, medicine, um, we saw that art was everywhere at Hopkins. People were doing it all over the place. So we put together a little working group a couple of years back, maybe three years ago, and we did an asset map. And we found over 150 programs where the arts and aesthetic experience were being used either within the hospital or in the community. And we started to build these alliances. And then um, uh, Peabody, which is our music conservatory, um, started to create several courses for musicians and dancers. And we started to do research projects within Hopkins, which we do quite, a, we're doing quite a number of those now. Um, and now we're getting calls from um, administrators and clinicians and healthcare leadership 
to um, enhance this work. So now it's not a foreign idea, um, but I think it took a couple of years to just keep coming at it. And then, you know, COVID, if there's a silver lining here is administrators have been brought to their knees and they know how badly their, 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 their clinicians and their staff are feeling. And they've seen the instant, immediate, accessible access to movement and to sound and to um, even journaling um, and other, you know, individualized playlists in cars on the way to work. All of these things that have really helped to just spitball through the pandemic. And I think there's a much greater value and respect for this integration of you know, human expression and the art and, and healing. Um, medical schools are also, you know, obviously really beginning to do more and more of this. Um, uh, there's a, been a, there's a, last year, there was a report from um, uh, the American Medical Association and the American Academy of Sciences looking at the role of arts and aesthetic experiences for medical professionals. So um, you're seeing all these pieces now beginning to weave together. Um, but I think you have to keep going at it with your, um, your um, administrators and evidence matters, not, not just because it's um, a stamp, but because it provides informed knowledge, new knowledge about how to enhance the practice of arts, health, and well-being. And so um, I think I think we're seeing that the, the tide is, is really churning um, and it's very exciting. It's incredibly exciting, Susan. Um, this, yeah, this talk is giving me so much energy for the work that we're already engaged in. Um, there is a, a, a question from Sharon Skull. She says, she thinks this concept could also be used with the elderly, not just in nursing homes, but at home. How do you see this? Mm -hmm. No, it's true. Um, so I think another gold, silver lining from the um, pandemic has been telehealth and connecting people who are so isolated. And so um, I, I absolutely think that the one-on-one the -on -one in home healthcare, either social worker or arts worker is a viable model. I also think telehealth can be really, really helpful. And we've seen that in, in, in lots of ways. Um, Mark Morris Dance Company has done enormous work globally in the pandemic to get Tele, tele dancing for Parkinson's patients and now others that have sort of sort of joined in. Um, but this work is um, totally um, uh, viable and, and important across the lifespan. And um, we're doing an economic analysis right now um, with AARP on the value of music for dementia patients. And can you keep people home longer? Can they work more productively longer? Can they keep um, stronger cognitive skills longer through the use of either individual music or group music? Um, can, can they um, live longer? And so we're looking at what, what's the role of the healthcare provider in that context? Um, what's the role of burnout for the family member using music in that context? So, so there's a lot of really interesting work that's being done with an aging population and research sort of coming in behind that. Um, uh, there, there also are a number of apps that are being developed that are being used for senior care um, using different art modalities and um, um, that can be easily implemented at home or uh, you know, that are really, um, think of them as toolkits that can be used for, fa that family members can use. But there's really basic things that we can think about, like how do you use light? How do you use color? Um, how do you use movement for aging adults at home that are maybe um, have mild uh, cognitive decline or are just aging in a healthy way? How do you continue to think about healthy aging to sort of stay off some of that natural cognitive decline that happens, happens in aging? So, um, and prevention, is so much less expensive expensive than intervention. Um, yep. uh, you know, and 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 you know, our healthcare system is not built on that for the most part. We're really a, we're really an intervention um, model, and we see that eight out of ten ten dollars is spent on that last two years of life. Um, 
But then when you look at other countries that are using social prescribing or thinking about prevention or thinking about social emotional development through the lens of the arts for young people, and even thinking about museums and um, healthy aging, um, it, it's a very different um, equation. It is, especially when you think about um, burnout and turnover, right? And how expensive that is. And I think that's another way administrators have really woken up to say, wait a minute, we can no longer ignore this. We really need to, I think COVID, that's another, you know, silver lining that COVID is. I agree with that. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Retention and also morale and uh, mental health issues and team building, you know, and and so you can easily see how these aesthetic experiences um, in all their forms. And that was one of the things we saw at Hopkins was there are choral groups for operating teams. They sing together. So Uh they sing together. So they know how to perform, they know how to perform literally surgery better together. Um, You know, I think there's so many um, transfers of this work into other areas. Yes, our music therapist calls it entrainment, right? When, exactly. when you entrain musically, you can entrain in every other way because it's yeah. neurologically designed. And there's these psychological aspects that we're talking about, but there's also the basic biological changes that happen in the prefrontal cortex that happen in the amygdala, that hap- that neurotransmitters that are reduced like dopamine or oxytocin or serotonin, where you're reducing cortisol. So, you know, there are real biological changes that are happening. So, um, you know, sometimes I think uh, anecdotal or intuitive or psychological outcomes um, um, don't get you know, someone said to me recently, well, you know, the arts are really about entertainment. And I said, thank goodness, we need entertainment. We need distraction. We need that as human beings. Like why is entertainment like frivolous? It's something we need, right? So wayfinding happens there and mind wandering and all of the things that we need to be able to figure out who we are in the world and what we want to contribute. So I think the lack of the less pejorative language around arts being a nice to have, not a have to have, is shifting. And um, Yo-Yo Ma talks about this beginner's mind. And I think that's another aspect of this work is how do we, how do we show up and what, what, what do we need? Wow, um, very, very inspiring, Susan. I, we have a couple more questions, but we also only have about four minutes. So I'm gonna try to squeeze in one more, okay? okay. Um, Mark Moss is our principal investigator. He's a doctor here at uh, University Health. Um, he's also the lead of our choral research. And he is asking about um, gardens and how the Duke Gardens are next to the hospital versus being in them. So he's asking, is the real exposure to nature even better than virtual exposure in general? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, There are certain um, healthcare systems now that are giving someone kind of, you know that thing you get at a restaurant that beeps when it's your time to sit down, that they sign in, they give them the beeper and they go to the garden and they know that stress is reduced, anxiety is reduced, there's a greater sense of calm coming into an appointment. And, and that can be both emergent care and it can also be just general sort of um, pediatricians or other, other forms. I mean, nature is the ultimate elixir and we were born in nature. We came out of nature. We're bring, trying to bring nature in. And so whenever and wherever you can have that absolute experience. Um, I was gonna share with you that right now we're in cicada season. And so um, I took a walk right before this call and there is this humming vibration in the air and it is absolutely extraordinary. Like it's so alien, but it opens up your senses, right? It lifts you up and you can't, you can't fake that, right? You can, you can have all kinds of great audio, but being in nature and having all your senses respond to that. And so if healthcare can bring nature in and put people in nature, and there are lots of examples of that. Scandinavian hospitals are doing a great job of building treehouse rooms that are all glass where the nature is coming in the windows. So cool. Um, Susan, I wanna make sure that everyone has access to you after this talk. There are some incredible resources that your colleague Megan has put in the chat. but also your contact information will be available on our website, which is the Coral um, website for 
Colorado Research and Arts Lab um, or Resilience and Arts Lab. So you can find this lecture there. It will be recorded. It has been recorded. It will be available there along with any resources in a, uh, addition to it. We did miss a couple of the questions. I just want to thank you because this has been oh, really you. enlivening for me and our work as a, a group here in Colorado, but a group that really wants to have impact on a national level. Um, so thank you. And we hope to continue this partnership. I also want to let everyone know that we do have a, a wonderful speaker coming again next month. Um, her name is Dr. Jandell Allen Davis. She's the president and CEO of Craig Hospital here in Colorado. Um, we'll have a new host next month. It'll be Michael Henry, who's the executive director of Lighthouse Writers Workshop and a really charming, fascinating poet. Um, so I just want to say thank you to you, Susan, and really for opening up this conversation and all the vast knowledge that you hold and are contributing to the, the body of knowledge across the country. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. It's really an important series and very excited to, to be part of it and to listen in on it. All right. So I hope we'll be in touch and to everyone else have a beautiful Friday and a beautiful weekend. Thank you. Bye, Susan.